welcome to Biker's podcast, where we explore the latest advancements in health, biohacking and general human optimization. I'm Teemu Arina from Biker Center, and today we have a truly mind-expanding topic to explore. We're going to discuss nothing else than psychedelics and their use for mental health. I'm thrilled to have a renowned wellness expert and biochemist, Sean Wells, as our guest speaker today. Sean is here to share his insights on the science of psychedelics, their effectiveness in clinical studies, and the challenges and opportunities of psychedelic therapy. As a biochemist, he will discuss the role of neurotransmitters beyond serotonin in mood regulation, supplements to enhance the effects of psychedelics, different microdosing protocols, and carefully designed stacks to use before and after a psychedelic journey. You may have heard about microdosing, where you take below a threshold noticeable dose of a psychedelic for mood enhancement, productivity, or creativity. This has gained popularity, especially in the creative tech elite in San Francisco and beyond. I will share some of the details about microdosing after Sean Wells' presentation. One of the fascinating new terms that Sean Wells introduces in his presentation is echo dosing. This means that after a proper journey, you take an echo of a microdose, sometimes repeatedly, to help you with the integration process. It's a fascinating alchemical concept for sure to get the most out of your therapeutic sessions with psychedelics. It has been addressed by several experts throughout these last few decades that it's really important to have proper time and methods for integration work. But before we dive into this intriguing topic, let me tell you a little bit about Sean Wells. With his extensive background in biochemistry and formulation, Sean has been on the forefront of the wellness industry for years, working on unique supplement formulations and novel compounds such as theacrine, dynamine, and paraxanthine. All of these are optimized derivatives of stimulants such as caffeine. I'm sure we will cover some of that work of optimizing caffeine in future episodes. Now, Sean has also served on the editorial board of the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, so he certainly knows what he is talking about when he dives into novel compounds. In this presentation, Sean shares an intimate personal story on how psychedelics transformed his life, especially in dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts. Then he explores the therapeutic potential of psychedelics and shares some of his advice as a biochemist. Now let's hear from the man himself, Sean Wells, as he takes us on a journey through the world of psychedelics and their potential for mental health optimization. Get ready for some really mind-expanding, eye-opening, compelling research and practical recommendations from a true expert in the field. Over to you, Sean. We are in Amsterdam. And this is a very apt topic, psychedelics. It's been a huge part of my life, a massive shift for me. Psychedelics transformed who I was. I was on the edge of suicide at several points in my life. And if you know me, I've talked a lot about mental health, the depression I've dealt with. So this is a topic that's very close to my heart. And I took my biochemistry knowledge. I took my formulation knowledge that I've been doing for 20 years. And I've brought that into the world of psychedelics. And I'm now working on unique strains, unique stacks, protocols. And looking at the therapeutic aspects and the science of these psychedelics. But I'll have you know, it's very important to understand that there is a deep spiritual aspect to these that I'm not going to delve into. And I'm not an expert in. I'm not a shaman. I'm not a guru. I'm not ayahuascaro. I'm not one of these people that are so brilliant at navigating those spaces, and I'm not going to pretend to be. These statistics should stun you. This is when I realized I'm not alone. And I think many of you that have dealt with depression, PTSD, anxiety, suicidal thoughts may feel alone. It's natural to feel that way. But look at these numbers. 23% more patients are on antidepressants than five years prior. That's a massive jump. These things are just being given out like crazy. And of course, we know what's been happening the last few years is playing a role in that. 308 million people worldwide have PTSD. That's almost the population of the United States. Again, a stunning number. 10.3 million adults had serious 
suicidal thoughts, an increase of nearly half a million people from the year prior. You want to know the pandemic? This is it. This is the pandemic. Mental health. And as you're seeing mental health come to the forefront, you're seeing more studies. You're seeing the efficacy not be shunned anymore of these compounds of MDMA, of psilocybin, ketamine. So now you're seeing all these studies come in and you're also seeing money come in. And that's been the huge shift in these things becoming more legal is there's money to be made. And you're seeing the regulatory impacts of that with the Biden administration trying to make some of these things more legal. But I think globally, you will see everything shift. Certain states have already shifted in the United States. Certainly Amsterdam, you're seeing this be a place where a lot of these things are somewhat legal. And there will be a global change that's coming. The next five to 10 years, there will be radical shifts. And so we need to know the science behind these ingredients as more people will start to use them. The popular psychedelics that are being used in research are psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, and now somewhat LSD and ibogaine. But it's important to see this research is using facilitated psychotherapy. So these psychedelics are, yes, being given, but they're being given in the right set and setting with the right people that are helping set intentions, do the integration work, as well as a facilitated experience. They're there with you throughout the experience. When you don't have this, you just have a journey on your own, and those can be special. But when you talk to a lot of people like, oh, I've done this recreationally, that's so different than someone guiding you and someone helping you integrate this work. I can tell you there's nothing worse that coming out of a psychedelic experience, seeing your truth, and then going back to your regular life and doing nothing about it. You feel worse. You can come out of these experiences feeling worse if you don't have the facilitation in one dose of psilocybin. With depressed patients, there was a 10% growth of the neurons. They got 10% bigger and there was 10% more. These are your brain cells. It's bringing the brain back online. Your brain can actually shrink with depression. It becomes less functional with depression. It's trying to save itself, save energy, feel less. The brain is coming back online. 71% of the people, and this is a psilocybin study with depression, 71% of the people who took the psilocybin had a 50% or more reduction in depression symptoms in just four weeks. Do you ever hear about that with these antidepressant drugs? At the conclusion of the study, 50% of those participants did not need to have further medical intervention. Essentially, they were cured. That's pretty stunning. Here's another study, Johns Hopkins with psilocybin. This was a 12-month study. They continued to do that integration work and follow up. 58% needed no further treatment at 12 months. 60% of people, essentially, six out of 10, needed no further treatment. You think we should be talking about this? It's frustrating to me that we're not talking about this, that this is being considered drugs, that this is considered illegal or immoral. And even if you feel that way, I can tell you as someone who's battled depression and suicidal thoughts and certainly been friends with people that are soldiers or EMT people or sexual abuse victims, that they need help and they're not getting access to it. And that frustrates me. It may not be your thing, but let's not make it no one's thing. When these could be clear solution, MDMA, 42 participants that got MDMA. By the way, I love how this is set up again, set up the right way. This isn't just clinical studies and let's just give this ingredient in a clinical environment. This is three 90-minute preparatory sessions, three eight-hour experimental sessions based one month apart where they discuss things and they do this integration work. They're following up. They're connecting with them. How are you doing? How can we help you? Let's guide you. You're not in this alone. And so what do we see? 67% 
no longer met the diagnostic criteria of PTSD. Two out of three people. These numbers are massive. This is cures, solutions, and it's not getting out there. How much have you guys heard this data on psilocybin and MDMA? Clearly, it's not making its way out to everyone. Probably not making its way to your doctor who's continuing to escalate the prescriptions for antidepressants. Ketamine, fast acting. This one is legal in the U.S. in a clinical environment. It's the speedster of antidepressants, works within hours. It's incredible in particular for PTSD because it has a dissociative effect and people can see themselves apart from their trauma. Our ego tends to lock into trauma and make that a part of your identity. It feels like this is who I am. This is what I deserve. And you're scared of who you would be without your trauma. It sounds good to say you don't want the trauma, but in reality, you're so deeply tied to it. And ketamine can dissociate you from that. It's like putting down your backpack and then taking a look at it and saying, I don't need to wear that backpack anymore. This feels good without it. I can see what this feels like now without that. And I feel good. And so we see it's a speedster. It works far faster than SSRIs. So let's talk about SSRIs. This serotonin theory has been going around for years. And it's been promoted since the 1990s. And the idea of SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, making you circulate more serotonin. Because serotonin is the feel-good neurotransmitter. So this is all about serotonin. And in reality, we're not seeing the great benefits that they're talking about. The serotonin theory of depression has been one of the most influential and extensively researched biological theories on depression. And where are we? Those suicide rates are going up. Those PTSD rates are going up. Depression's going up. If antidepressants exert their effects as placebos or by numbing emotions, then it is not clear that they do any more good than harm. This is from a meta-analysis where they looked at all the studies on SSRIs. The conclusions, the benefits of antidepressants seem to be minimal and possibly without any importance to the average patient with major depressive disorder. Antidepressants should not be used for adults with major depressive disorder before valid evidence has shown that the potential benefits, the potential beneficial effects outweigh the harmful effects. This is from 2022. Meta-analysis. And so we're fed this idea that it's all about serotonin. And we have a lot of neurotransmitters. There's a lot going on in the brain. And just inhibiting this, this one path isn't the whole solution. I do like the idea of serotonin. I don't dismiss the value of serotonin in depression. But it's not the only solution. It's not the one thing to look at. So looking at serotonin is an oversimplification. And I want to look at all these neurotransmitters, of which there's excitatory, inhibitory, modulatory neurotransmitters. And these are the key ones. It's not just serotonin. Acetylcholine, glutamate, dopamine, norepinephrine, histamine, GABA, glycine, endorphins. These are all playing a role in your mood and your brain health. And you can see here, yes, serotonin is depressed in those that suffer from depression, PTSD, anxiety, but so is glutamate, norepinephrine, GABA, dopamine. Do you know what won't bring those back online in SSRI? Do you know what does bring all of those neurotransmitters back online? That's right. Psychedelics do. It has a global impact on the brain. And we see because of that, and by the way, a lot of depression is correlated to neuroinflammation as well as fatigue, that psychedelics reduce that inflammation both systemically and neurologically. It also improves the immune system. We get the immune system back online. But I want you to know that each of these psychedelics work differently. They don't all work the same way. So there may be one that's more tailored to you and your experience. Neuroplasticity is super key. It's how resilient your brain is. When your brain is depressed, it's not resilient. You are low in BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And you stay in loops. When I was very depressed, someone would say one thing to me, and for hours I would sit on that. I would stew on that. I would stay in my loop. It was very unhealthy. I didn't quickly reframe 
in a neuroplastic way. So it's associated with BDNF, also NGF, also mTOR. So there's several proteins. It's an oversimplification, again, to say just BDNF. But it's important to think about these neurons when your neuroplastic can unwire and rewire. We can throw fresh powder on the tracks if you've been going down these tracks for years because there they are, there's your tracks and here's your skis. You can throw fresh powder on the trail and blaze a new path, a whole new path. This is what can happen when BDNF is elevated. Let's read this quote. Participants rank their psilocybin experience as one of the most meaningful in their lives, comparable to the birth of a first child or the death of a parent. Two-thirds of the participants rated the session among their top five most spiritually significant experiences of their lives. One-third ranked it the most significant such experience in their lives, above marriage, above the death of a parent, above the birth of a child. I love Michael Pollan and... There is a documentary out on Netflix that does a great job. He has a book as well. This goes through ketamine and psilocybin. I recommend watching it. And so here's the way I believe psychedelics work. It's not just neurotransmitter. That's what science has said for years is that psychedelics are all about neurotransmitters and you having a chemical imbalance. They've said for years that mostly it's serotonin. And you can see what a gross oversimplification that is that it's about neuroplasticity. It's about hacking the ego, turning off default mode network. It's about dissociation, getting into that parasympathetic state, that relaxed state. When I was working on psychedelics, I had rarely ever been in a parasympathetic state. I was always vigilant, inflammation modulation and ketones. So supplements, I'm a supplement guy, adaptogens are amazing. I think all of you should be taking them, cycle through them, Things like rhodiola, ashwagandha, they have a bimodal effect. They can energize you and relax you. And that's where we want to be. That's the flow state. That's in the balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Supplements that can enhance blood flow to the brain would obviously be ideal in a journey. Things like niacin, ginkgo biloba, venpositine, acetyl L-carnitine, electrolytes and hydration. This is one you probably hear but I'll definitely reinforce getting your element T or your electrolyte blends, certainly getting magnesium and just taking some table salt if you have that and certainly water. CBD, hopefully this is available to you. The cannabidiol can have a profound impact. I could do a whole talk on just the ECS, the endocannabinoid system, the master regulator system. It's controlling mood, pain, inflammation, immunity, and yet there's no doctor specializing in the endocannabinoid system that I know of. And so there's so much research to be done on these cannabinoids and the impact that they can have. In particular, some things like MDMA have been theorized to be potentially mildly, at least temporarily neurotoxic. So it might be ideal to take some of these neuroprotectant supplements, vitamin C, carotenoids, polyphenols, mitochondrial enhancers, curcumin, cannabinoids. So I don't hate serotonin. And certainly when you're coming out of these experiences with your massive growth abundance, you can feel that contraction afterwards. And getting serotonin back online is ideal. I love Zembrin, which is a Kana extract, a natural SSRI. I wouldn't use an SSRI constantly, but I like the idea of post-journey having serotonin build back up faster. And that's going to help when you're taking some of these other ones that are giving you the foundation to do that. So saffron, especially standardized for saffronol. SAMI, 5-hydroxytryptophan. This is a really good stack, this Kana and 5-HTP. And then vitamin D3. Acetylcholine, when you're focused, when you're doing deep work, if your journey is like one where you're really thinking and going in and not just being playful and loving and whatever then acetylcholine is probably depleted. And so getting acetylcholine back online is important. So you don't feel low energy, low productivity for the days and weeks following your journey. So acetylcholine is going to come back online with acetyl L-carnitine, the acetyl group donor, alpha GPC or citicholine for the choline piece, and then huperzine A as an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. Anxiolytic supplements. These are supplements that reduce your anxiety. 
this is great if you just have anxiety in general, but sometimes going into journey experiences can be anxiety inducing. The journey typically starts when you commit to the journey, not when you're necessarily doing the journey. I've had people be in a car with me going through a journey over a four hour drive and they're losing their minds because stuff's coming up from unconscious to subconscious to the conscious mind. And now they're thinking on what's about to happen. And so being able to lean in to get into parasympathetic is going to make these compounds much more effective like psilocybin. The better you get at doing these journeys, the lower your doses of these substances should be because you're training yourself to be more parasympathetic. It's not like a body size thing. It's actually my nervous system. I might take twice as much because I'm coming into the journey, but like I was just in traffic. I'm a type A personality. What's about to happen? People are going to see me. I'm freaking out. I'm going to need more to get overpowered to get into that parasympathetic state. Whereas if Amy's already coming in, parasympathetic, it's going to take a much lower dose. So microdosing, LSD, I tend to associate with positivity, happiness, blissfulness, insightfulness, creativity. This has been a powerful tool for many. Typically microdosing is at one tenth the more experiential light journey dose. And this is Fadiman's protocol where you do 10 micrograms every third day. And you can stack it with other nootropics, things like N-acetyltyrosine, things like the race tams, like Paracetam or new peps. Ketamine reset. I really think this is cool. This is by Dr. Matt Cook. So when he does his ketamine protocol, he's also giving things to reset the mitochondria like CoQ10, like NAD, and he's giving stem cells. So he's giving the body a chance to go down this path of full reset physiologically and neurologically. What better time? You will be far more receptive to these things making change to you using them when you're in this state. And that's what he's seen. He's seen a dramatic change versus just giving exosomes or giving stem cells, giving NAD. When you do this, it's much better. This is Paul Stamets protocol for microdosing psilocybin, lion's mane, niacin, etc. So I wanted to talk quickly about a few ingredients, L-ergothionine. This one's a mitochondrial antioxidant. It's brand new and it's being looked at as a potential new vitamin. It protects the mitochondria. It's pretty breakthrough and is one of the things that I would recommend using post churning. This one smokes lion's mane, smokes lion's mane. It's better than injecting BDNF. That's stunning. 7,8-dihydroxyflavone is the ultimate thing I know of for a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, for neuroplasticity. And maybe its metabolite could be even better, but there's even less research on that. The 4-DMA, 7,8-dihydroxyflavone. This one, dihydromyrcetin, is potent at helping with hangovers. Not just alcohol hangovers, but I've been using it with journeys when you tend to feel low, brain fog, exhausted that next day or two, this one can help quite a bit. And yes, if you're going out drinking, this would be a good one to take. Perizanthine is a breakthrough metabolite of caffeine. Caffeine is toxic and actually is a toxin in plants to repel bugs. We convert caffeine to perizanthine. This is the thing we want. This is the thing that has all the benefits. The theophylline is toxic. Theobromine largely has no benefit. And so for 60% of us, we're slow metabolizers of caffeine and we're stuck with side effects more than benefits in this caffeinated state and not getting the perizanthine. And so we see with perizanthine, neuroprotective, increases glutathione and catalase, increases dopamine and serotonin, improved blood flow to the brain, increased BDNF greater focus, memory, accuracy, energy. This is a breakthrough ingredient and I think will have a profound impact in this space. Experiment with some of these things. I'm giving you all my tools. You don't need to use all of them. Bring your brain back online to be more productive, to have a better mood day to day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean Wells, for sharing your personal story and advice on psychedelics for therapeutic use. Now, let me share some insights on microdosing. 
Microdosing involves using sub-perceptual doses of psychedelic substances. Typically, this means LSD or magic mushrooms, but many other classical psychedelics have also been used, such as mescaline from cacti, DMT from ayahuasca and related plants, and ibogaine from iboga. For psilocybin mushrooms, that means about 0.1 to 0.3 grams of dried mushrooms, while a typical dose, a macro dose, would be more than 2 grams. For LSD, the microdose would be 5 to 20 micrograms of LSD, while typical doses start from 100, 150 and up. Scientific research on microdosing is limited, with most of the evidence coming from anecdotal reports and self-reported experiences. Perhaps the most prominent explorer of microdosing has been James Fadiman, the co-founder of the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology and the author of the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. Some of the anecdotal reports collected by Fadiman and others, and also some studies, smaller studies, suggest the potential benefits of microdosing. Number one, some users report improved mood, increased well-being, and enhanced positivity while microdosing. Number two, other users report improved cognitive function, including increased creativity, problem-solving abilities, and focus. Number three, some others suggest that microdosing may have anxiety and stress-reducing effects. Number four, microdosing has been associated with increased emotional awareness, empathy, and better emotional regulation. Number five, some preliminary studies have also suggested that microdosing may have potential benefits for mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Now, some limited studies have explored microdosing in a more controlled setting, so let me share you a few of such studies. The first study was conducted by Quantified Citizen QC and formally titled Psilocybin Microdosers Demonstrate Greater Observed Improvements in Mood and Mental Health at One Month Relative to Non-Microdosing Controls. This was published in Nature Scientific Reports in 2022. The study shows that psilocybin microdosing is associated with general improvements in mood and mental health. Additionally, a finding specific to individuals over the age of 55 indicates that microdosing was associated with greater improvements in psychomotor performance, especially when stacked with lion's mane and niacin, which is known as the infamous Paul Stamets stack. This stack basically uses the flush version of niacin to make the brain more receptive to the features of psilocybin and lion's mane to stimulate the neural growth factors. This may theoretically have potential use for treating mental decline and different nervous system conditions, although no formal studies have been conducted for this purpose yet. Another study published in Addiction Biology in 2022 studied LSD for microdosing. The study was titled Repeated Low Doses of LSD in Healthy Adults, a placebo-controlled dose-response study, and it noted a slightly stimulant effect but didn't really find any improvements in mood or performance. On the safety side, a proper macro dose on a not-so-regular basis seems to have been safe in cultural and historical settings, as most of these psychedelics have been used by different cultures, including ayahuasca, mescalina, psilocybin, for thousands of years. The repeated daily microdosing and its longitudinal effects do not have such a cultural or historical context. It is important to note that LSD, for example, exerts its effects through the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor, and 5-HT2A receptors are expressed in many tissues and organs throughout the human body, including the brain, gut, and cardiovascular system. This might be the reason why it has this stimulant effect. There may be some issues on regularly stimulating these receptors on a daily basis, but there is not enough evidence yet or research conclusions. We might know soon a lot more as psychedelics are being decriminalized or legalized in a number of countries and cities around the world. For example, in U.S., in Oregon, San Francisco, Washington, Oakland, Santa Cruz, Seattle, Detroit, and Denver, psilocybin mushrooms are decriminalized. So is in some countries like the Netherlands, Costa Rica, Bahamas, Jamaica, Portugal, and Brazil. They have all made mushrooms either legal or decriminalize them. For example, in Oregon, you can carry a personal possession of up to 12 grams of psilocybin mushrooms. On a more gray area, some countries in the world, such as Mexico and Thailand, in some parts of them, the locals do look 
through their fingers when it comes to magic mushrooms. On a more official side, in Oregon and Colorado, they have legislature in place to allow the regulated access to psilocybin therapy sessions. In Canada, they have also passed laws to allow psilocybin and MDMA sessions under the Compassionate Access Scheme. Now, we will definitely dive deeper into psychedelics in future episodes. You may be interested in our upcoming conference, the Biker Summit on 14 and 15 of October 2023 in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. The theme of this conference is expanding consciousness in all its various modalities from fasting and ice bathing to supplements and psychedelics. You can learn more about the conference at bikersummit.com. Thank you very much for listening. That's all guys, so expand your mind in a responsible way and see you on the other side.